Hello everybody, my name is Nkozi and this is the Two Sides of a Coin podcast. This week we're going to be doing TV show review 2, Electric Boogaloo. This is just because my schedule has been so busy that I haven't been able to go to the movies to see anything new. I have a couple movies lined up for the next week and obviously, you know, the big one that's coming out next week will be Fast X, so... I'll give you that review when I can, but for right now, only thing I have is a couple of TV shows that I have wanted to talk about for a little bit, so in this week, we're going to do a season review for the show Not Dead Yet. Also, we're going to do the next two episodes from the Russo brother Citadel. I talked about that about two weeks ago and I really wasn't on board with it so we'll see if my decision has changed considering two weeks have passed you know we've gotten the third and fourth episode so let's jump into it and see if my uh, opinion of that show has changed so in talking about the TV show not dead yet the main person that we should talk about is its lead, Gina Rodriguez. And she's been in the game for almost 20 years. Her first role was in Law & Order, which it is the quintessential role for any actor coming in. Honestly, I think Law & Order has launched more careers than almost any TV show, I think, maybe even in the history of TV. I'd have to look that up. That sounds like a really good episode later on. Anyways, Gina Rodriguez has been in the game since 2004 with her first episode of Law & Order. She's actually on there twice as two different people, as you do with Law & Order. And she's been steadily working ever since. She's been in movies, and she really didn't truly hit big until her recurring role on The Bold and the Beautiful, which is a soap opera. And she really didn't get into the huge cultural zeitgeist until she was on her The CW Show as the lead role, Jane Villanueva in Jane the Virgin, which lasted for about five seasons. So she's, after Jane the Virgin ended, she's been in a couple movies. She starred in Miss Bala and Annihilation, Kajillionaire, she was in Scoob. None of these roles, you know, they were good, but none of thing really popped out. So I think it's great that she's gotten another crack at the full on lead role in this T V show Not Dead Yet. Now in the show Not Dead Yet, she plays Nell Serrano, who is a reporter who did the fairy tale thing, which is she left the U.S. for love in a different country in London. She disappeared, left her successful career as any good Hallmark movie would have you believe, left it and was getting married, all of that stuff. And when she's coming back, she looks like a hot mess. Why? Because it all fell through. She left her soon-to-be husband. Five years in the UK are gone. So now she's come back to the US having to rebuild her career as a newspaper reporter. And the one thing that they don't tell you in those Hallmark movies when you only do things for love is that if it doesn't work out you are in a really bad spot because when she went to the UK she wasn't working she was in love being the housewife and when she comes back to go back to her job as a reporter all the work that she'd been making at that point did not work out and she went way down on the totem pole. In fact, she's so low on the totem pole that she 
got her job and she's now writing obituaries. So, and writing these obituaries, that's a simple job. It should be just, you write something up real simple, you put it out in the paper and it goes well. Funny enough, she learned something writing these obituaries, which is she can see and hear the person who she is writing the obituary about. That's right. Not dead yet. She sees dead people. Maybe she's going to see Bruce Willis from The Sixth Sense. I don't know. Although, I doubt it. So, this show, while it focuses on the dead people, the dead people are more like a garnish around the main cast as a whole. So, in this show, uh, as we talked about, we have Gina Rodriguez. She is a reporter and she is trying to rebuild her life after being in this long relationship. And I actually think Gina Rodriguez is really good in this role. And I think this kind of lends to that this sort of kind of fits into that same role of Jane the Virgin. Not in terms of the super ridiculousness of Jane the Virgin, because Jane the Virgin was just a CW version of a Spanish telenovela. Whereas with this show, this is just a regular sitcom. And because Gina Rodriguez is so experienced in this, she falls into this role and it feels supernatural. Not the show Supernatural, even though she was on the CW, but it feels super space natural. She is, she disappears into Nell Serrano, where I forgot that she was Gina Rodriguez for a little bit. So big ups to her. She does great work in this show and she is both vulnerable and difficult and funny and charming, but also sometimes weird and unapproachable. But yet, at the end of the day, she still wins you over. Another thing I really like about this show is when you look at the cast, it has so many people who are real veterans when it comes to sitcoms and comedies and can really elevate this show to I think a much higher degree than it normally would be elevated just based off the premise and the writing which is okay it's not amazing but I think this is a perfect example of when writing is supplemented by good actors that know what they're doing then it can really have a huge impact. For example, you have Hannah Simone. She plays Sam, Nell's best friend, and that name might sound familiar to you because Hannah Simone was also in another pretty long-running sitcom that was called New Girl. She was Cece in that, and she was a huge part of that show. So you can tell that she is experienced in this because from the very moment you see her, she seems relatable, she seems fun, she seems like she is disappearing into the role, and they really do have chemistry, Hannah and Gina's character, so you get the fact that she is supposed to be Nell's best friend, and it really comes across every moment that they're on screen, that these two are the best of friends. Also, on here, you have Lauren Ash, who plays Lexi. She's Nell's boss. And when I saw her, I knew her because she was on a sitcom that I absolutely loved. And that's Superstore. So, you see, you just have some of the three biggest names on this TV show in terms of on the woman side are all women who are experienced actresses that have all been on long running sitcoms so it really helps i think 
in terms of from a writing perspective, as well as I think just from a acting perspective that all of these people are so experienced that they can buoy and raise up the overall level of this show. Also in this show, you have uh, Rick Glassman. He plays Edward, Nell's autistic roommate. You have Joshua Banday. He plays Dennis, another friend of Nell. And you also have who we are surprised to see, which is Angela E. Gibbs. She plays a widowed owner of a bar that specializes in wine. And I remember Angela E. Gibbs because she was actually on a very funny TV show that I liked from Adult Swim called Black Jesus. And if you've seen Black Jesus, you know exactly who she is. She is Miss Tootie on Black Jesus. So big ups to her. She is on network TV. She's been working in the in Hollywood for years. So I always love it when I see people who've been grinding, grinding, grinding away, get chances to get long term roles on TV shows. So another thing that I really do like about this show is because you have this premise of these are dead people, you can put a lot of great actors and actresses as the side characters who are just doing one-offs they don't need to come back even though there have been one or two that have come back you know on several occasions like martin mole mo collins britney snow julia sweeney uh paula pell ed begley jr telma hopkins Rhea Perlman. I mean, there are a lot of really big names, people who you've seen, people who you might have loved in other in other TV shows and other movies. All of these actors and especially their older actors sometimes. And that's the thing I do love about Not Dead Yet. It gives a beautiful showcase for older actors to come on and get work as well as sometimes younger actors to get work. So that's mainly the number one thing I do like about this show is just because it has that recurring element of the main actor can see dead people. She sees dead people so she can write their obituary and because she can see dead people, she is a better writer because she can get information from the source so i do love that about the show i love how the cast interacts with each other it's simple it's very episodic it's very clear what's going to happen in each episode i would say within the first 10 minutes but i think with sitcoms especially that's what you should be expecting you shouldn't be expecting big twists to happen in a sitcom every single time. This is more of a feel-good show. It's supposed to make you laugh and make you feel good. It's not supposed to engage your psyche in the existential dread of what happens after you pass on. That's not what the show is about. This show is about having a good time, and I do think you can have a good time with this show. Now, does that mean this show doesn't have problems? Everything has problems. So let's go into some of the problems. At times, I don't love the writing. I feel like it can be a little bit too obvious. I know this is supposed to be a show where you can... Be obvious. I just feel that you can be obvious without talking down to your audience, which I feel the show does once or twice too much. Also, while it is funny most of the time, when the jokes don't land, they really don't land. They hit with a thud. So those are those are problems that I do have with the show. And 
while I'm interested and I really would want to see a season two, I would say in terms of my opinion, this show is a low home cooked meal. It's not amazing. It isn't something that I'm going to go out and rally and say, hey, everybody needs to see this show. I like it. I really do. And I think it can get even better considering this is only the first season. I think it's better when your show is okay in its first season and gets better as the years go on. But we also have this kind of cloud that hangs over this show and hangs over a lot of TV shows. But... That's something that we're going to talk about a little bit later in the episode. However, at this very moment, odds are looking good that we're going to get a second season of this show. So I'm going to hope for that. I think this show is good enough to get that second season. The first season, it was finding its legs. And I think the second season, it's really going to hit the ground running. So I really want to see these really good funny actors and actresses get another shot at fleshing out these characters deeper because the hardest thing to do in any tv show is to establish yourself that's where you're going to have the most growing pains once you've established yourself you are going to get better simply because you have a foundation i think the foundation for this show is solid enough where you can build something amazing off of it and if you don't then i would love to hear what you guys think about it if you guys don't like it if you guys think it's silly i i would love to hear from you guys so please feel free to leave a comment and let me know what you think so i watched the next two episodes of the Russo Brothers TV show, Citadel. And there are a few things I do want to bring up that I talked about in the last episode review I had for episode one and two. Number one, they're still doing the upside down thing. That seems like it is a very clear message, I guess. In regards to what this show is about how nothing is as it seems and the world is upside down. So we write the ship so that way you could truly see what's happening because everything is a move within a move. But it's it's like playing a game with a very, very young child where they think they're making a mysterious move. However, Because you've been playing it for a lot longer than they have, you can see what they're doing before they even see what they're doing. They're moving two steps ahead and you feel like you're four or five steps ahead of them. And that still feels like Citadel. Um, I'm sorry. I, I I want to come back and report that, hey, this show, it gripped me. It really took me in and I was really enjoying it and it was a struggle to get through these two episodes however I did get through the two episodes so we're gonna talk about them I'm gonna tell you what I thought about episode three and episode four and we are really going to get to probably my reason for why I just I'm not vibing with this show so let's let's jump into it so I guess we could start really with the good news from episode three and episode four I'm not going to go into the episodes in terms of piece by piece I'm just going to give a broad overview of both episodes at the same time now is that because I still am not in love with the show partially I also just think this show can do a lot of really good things 
but there are just some things that just they aren't working and I just find it more fascinating to talk about the things that isn't working rather than the things that do work. Now, I can happily report that when Richard Madden and Priyanka Chopra Jonas are on screen, they are still the most interesting part of this show. They clearly have chemistry. They work even when they're angry at each other, when they're happy when they're sad these two work and I'll give the show credit in this regard I actually think these two episodes better encapsulate that Richard Madden and Priyanka Chopra Jonas actually can work outside of just their interactions with each other because this show does a decent job in these last two episodes of showing more interactions with other cast members. We see Richard Madden's character. He interacts with another character, Osai Ikil, who's Carter Spence. He also is for Citadel. We see Priyanka Chopra Jonas. She also interacts with him as well as a, another character, uh, Grace, who's Nikki Amuka Bird. Now, if you don't know who she is, she's been in a whole bunch of TV shows and movies. I mostly remember her mainly from, in my opinion, her two biggest works, which is when she was with the uh, show Avenue 5 and when she was the detective sergeant slash the chief inspector on Luther, which I really like that show. So that's where I remember her character, her the actor from most of all. So I will say around this core, the TV show does seem to be working better. Also, big ups that it feels like a TV show now. It no longer feels like a movie that should have been shortened down. It actually feels like there could be something here. And I think the reason why it feels that way is because they're getting away from the action and the suspense and all the stuff that happens in the modern times. And they're showing a lot more stuff from the past. They're showing a lot more stuff from when they were spies and they didn't wipe their memories. That is the strongest part of this TV show, which to me begs the question, if all the stuff in the past is so much more interesting than anything that's happening in the present, why didn't we just start from the past? This show could have started with these spies working towards the common good and then we see them move through making things better, making things worse, hurting people, helping people, all of these things. Meanwhile, they have a mole, a spy, and they're trying to figure out who it is. This show is... And I think that's the most frustrating thing about it. This show has finally shown me the version of itself where it could work. This show has shown me that all these characters all work together. They vibe on a very good level. This show could be so good if it focused on the elements in the past. However... Because we've introduced this element where all oh, these people have lost their memories and one person lost their memories while the other person didn't and they're having to save the world. Citadel is having to stop these bad things from happening because it's shown me the version of itself that could work. It makes it so obvious the version of itself that doesn't work which is 
a lot of the stuff in the present. The action is okay. In this one, we had a big action set piece where they had to do a little bit more CGI, which the CGI on this is not great. I'm not going to lie. It honestly would have been better if they would have gone a little bit more practical at certain points. It also got a little bit glaring in terms of how much all of these bad guys are missing because... You know, they're doing the classic thing where the good guys can shoot something very, very easily. And the bad guys can barely hit the broadside of a barn. All of these bad guys could be recruited as stormtroopers because they're just not great shots, to be honest. They're just they're just not good. But I'll put that off to the side because... While the actors can still do some solid work. And we've learned a little bit more about this TV show. I know it's setting me up for the big twist. I know it. You know it. It's so obvious. They're setting you up for the big twist. They're setting you up for the moment where nothing is as it seems. Where everything is going to turn on its head in the next episode or two. So... I'm going to do something that I normally don't do. I'm going to make a prediction about this show. And what we're going to find out. And what we're going to find out is by the end of this series, end of this first season, we're going to find out that Richard Madden's character, he's the mole. And Priyanka Chopra Jonas is not the mole. We're going to find out Richard Madden's character is the mole and Priyanka Chopra Jonas was sent in there to find him and she fell in love with him. And that's why she's kind of sad, but also kind of happy that he is gone. And the only reason I think that is because this movie feels like a spy version of the Arnold Schwarzenegger classic total recall i don't know why it feels that way it just it feels like this guy who is inherently good who's trusting everything he says he's being told she's this person's the mole this person's the mole this person's the mole and maybe i'm wrong i hope i'm wrong i hope i am completely subverted in what is happening it just feels like the way they're pointing this show, they are pointing to the fact that Richard Madden's character, Mason Kane, was trying so hard to frame somebody for being a spy, a mole, when he, in fact, was the mole. And Priyanka Chopra Jonas's character was the mole hunter. So that is what I think. I also think... Richard Madden, he is the son of the evil lady that runs Manticore or is affiliated with Manticore, which is the UK Prime Minister, Dahlia. I could be wrong. It just, like I said earlier on, this show feels like it is trying to think that we're two steps behind it. And I feel like I'm five steps in front of it. And I really do want to be surprised. I so do want to be shocked. And if I am shocked, I will come on an episode of this podcast and I will say this show surprised the heck out of me because it went a direction that I did not expect it to go. And I am so happy it did. It showed me that as much as I know about tv it can still surprise me it can still excite me it can still change my point of view of how events are going to go and i love the russo brothers so please russo brothers i know you're not listening to this but if you are please tell me i'm wrong please tell me that this obvious thing at least to my eyes isn't obvious i i want to be wrong here but I'll I'll continue watching the show just because at this point I might feel like I'm hate watching it. 
honestly, it's still a high fast food. It's not terrible. And I think if you are unlike me and you can get past it or you're not seeing these, you know, obvious threads, at least to my eyes, then you know what? I'll wish you the best. So let's let's hope that this is going to be the last time that I am just not shocked by anything. And let's just let's hope that, hey, I'm wrong. The Russo brothers know more than I do. And we're all just going to have a big laugh about this. But. I just I just don't think so. However, I want to hear from you. What are your guys' thoughts about Citadel? About these last two episodes? Are you really enjoying this show? And if you're enjoying this show more than me, please tell me. What makes you enjoy this show so much? I, I would love to hear from you guys. Alright? So, one final note before I end the episode and that is the writer strike has happened so for those of you who are not familiar or just aren't paying attention to entertainment news the wga the writers guild of america has officially gone on strike so what that means is that for most television shows the people who are writing on those shows are writers they are writers who are in a union and they've decided that they are going to strike because the conditions for their new contract have not been met and they're going to deny work until the studios accede to their demands or come back to the bargaining table with suitable compromises so i'm just going to tell you right now i fully support the writers i am in a union myself i'm not going to tell you what union that is but i know that unions are one of the reasons that we have things that we as workers take advantage of and just think these always happened and it hasn't been the case like the five day work week is only the case because unions fought for five day work weeks equal pay for equal work is something that anybody who is an employee wants you want to be compensated for giving your time and energy for a job and I think it's really important to remember that even when numbers sound big when you're talking about contracts when you hear big numbers and you think well I'll do what they do for a third of what they're talking about or stuff like that I always think it's important to remember that the money that is being asked for is rarely, if ever, more than the company can bear. If you think that TV studios and all of that, that they can't afford to pay the writers or most union employees, let's let's be honest here. The entertainment industry is a multi-billion dollar industry it is in fact so big that when you think about multi-billion dollar industries you're talking about industries where if a million dollars or a couple million dollars or even two to three hundred million dollars could break your entire industry when your profits your profits after expenses mind you we're not talking about overall profits we're talking about net profits are over 
billions of dollars, then if you're saying this much money can break your business, guess what? Your business probably shouldn't still be around. There are many jobs. There are many jobs where they don't have that large of a bargaining tool where they don't make that amount of money. And if the writers were asking for an incredible amount of money, if they were asking for conditions that were considered, hey, this is unreasonable, then even as a person who is in a union, I would say, I think these demands are not reasonable. However, from the demands I've heard, which is increased pay, increased number of writers on jobs, as well as an increase in terms of the expected time that they're supposed to work, like a guarantee that says, hey, how long am I going to have this project? Am I going to work for X amount of weeks? Am I going to work for Y amount of weeks? Is it going to be eight? Is it going to be 10? Is it going to be 12? I want to know how long I'm going to work on this project. So that way, if I only work on this project for 10 weeks, I can plan for something further down the line. All of these requests that I've heard have been reasonable. So because the requests are so reasonable and because it really does sound like studios are just not willing to be reasonable, I'm going to say full-throated that I stand with the WGA and I hope they get this done soon because whenever you bring in new writers, like let's say this goes on for months and they're bringing in new writers to work on these shows, a lot of the writers that they're going to bring in the quote unquote new writers are going to be people who don't have the experience and are willing to work for whatever pay they get. However, they're also willing to sacrifice a lot in terms of any goodwill they're going to have with the union after the situation ends. So, when you get inexperienced people who are going to be working on big name TV shows or even small name TV shows, it's it's not going to be the same. The last writer strike was over a decade ago, and we all remember that certain shows just for a while, they didn't feel right. The writing was really bad. It felt like it was night and day. That was by design because they were hiring writers who weren't the writers for the show. They were hiring just other people who weren't union employees or who were union employees who were willing to cross the line and say, hey, I'm willing to work for a little bit of extra money. And it just it wasn't the same. So let's hope that this situation is resolved quickly. Because if it isn't resolved quickly, we are going to get some weird things that happen in regards to the TV and movie side. One of my biggest examples of that is when you look at James Bond, the Daniel Craig James Bond movies to be specific, I would think the weakest movie of those movies has been Quantum of Solace. Now, something that you may not know about Quantum of Solace, Quantum of Solace was filmed during that strike. And the big thing is, when Quantum of Solace was filmed, they had a script. However, when you are working on a union project, you have a script because they were still filming when the script was finished no rewrites could be done because only union writers could write on that project. So 
when you think about Quantum of Solace and you think about some of the things in that movie that may not have necessarily made sense or it just didn't come across right, that is the reason. It's because even though they completed the script, rewrites happen all the time. They happen at times on set. They happen at times after the movie has been shot where they'll go back and they'll say, all right, these scenes aren't working. Let's rewrite this. Let's reshoot certain things. Let's reshoot entire scenes. This is a standard practice that just wasn't able to happen on the movie Quantum of Solace because they didn't have the writers and they finished production, everything like that locked in the movie before they could well and truly make any of those changes. So I use that as the example of writers are important on every entertainment job. When you don't have good writers, it's very hard for the actors to look as good as they can act or act to their best ability. A great actor can look terrible with a badly written movie. Look at Ryan Reynolds and Green Lantern. The movie was bad not because Ryan Reynolds was bad. The movie was bad because the script was terrible. Most times when you look at good movies versus bad, the thing that separates them is the script much more than the acting. And my fear is that we're going to get a lot of really bad scripts if the writer's strike continues. So if any big executive is listening to this, if any studio head is listening to this, hey, sit down at the table and negotiate and get the writers back in the writer room because they want to write. They want to create. They want to make amazing stories. So work with them and pay them appropriately so that way they can make those great stories. Because at the end of the day, in entertainment, it's a business. You want to make money. You also want to make good quality stuff. And I know that with this writer strike happening, the amount of high quality stuff we're going to get might dip precipitously, especially into next year. But tell me how you guys felt. Tell me if you disagree. I mean, honestly, if you disagree, please don't tell me. Just stop listening to the show. I'm fully prepared for that. But I do want to hear if you guys have any different kind of perspective about the writer's strike or any thoughts around it in general. Thank you guys so much for listening to this week's episode. If you want to reach out to me, you can find me in several places. You can contact me on Twitter at Two Sides Coin. You can find us on Instagram at Two Sides of a Coin. That's T W O S I D E Z of a Coin, all one word. You can email us at Two Sides Podcast at gmail.com. And you can listen to the podcast on Podbean, on Spotify, and also on Apple Podcasts. So we hope to really hear from you guys. I love to hear and discuss anything you guys want to talk about. And we'll talk to you later.